we're delighted as part of this celebratory year uh, to have such prominent individuals as Gi Wook Shin, who is the Tongyang Korea Foundation and Korea Stanford Alumni Chair of Korean Studies at Stanford University. He is also the director of the Walter H. Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center, and he is the founding director of the Korea program at Stanford University. He's been a longtime friend of the Korea Society. Give a welcome. And it is a celebratory time in Korea as well as uh, Moon Jae-in assumes office. It has been a very active day, and we have seen some interesting things both in terms of substance and style. And we will turn to Professor Shin for his analysis. But a 41.1% uh, victory, and one where we saw a very large number voters come out to the poll, almost 80%. And so, Professor Shin, if we could get your reflections on how you perceive the election and your initial analysis. Okay, first of all, uh, congratulations on your 60th anniversary of Korea Society. And I'm very happy to be here uh, with you today. So I guess my uh, quick reaction was that uh, there was no surprise. Uh, as you know, uh, Moon Jae-in has been uh, leading the poll uh, throughout the campaign. I mean, there was a brief moment uh, when uh, An Chol Su was very close to Moon Jae-in. But other than that, uh, he was leading the poll throughout the campaign. So, you know, there's no uh, surprise and it's fairly expected. So I guess that's my first reaction. Sure. What does it mean in terms of the tumult of the last six months and where Korean voters find themselves today with a new president in office? So as you know, this was a five-way uh, competition. And then it's quite rare that, uh, you know, five people, I mean, you know, there are more, you know, people, but uh, you know, five major people can run for, you know, presidency. But I think, you know, people chose Moon Get largely under expectation that uh, you know he could make a you know, change to Korean society. So as you know, uh, you know, conservatives uh, have been under power for the last ten years, and I think Koreans wanted to have some change. Uh, I think they found Moon uh, to be the best person to do that. Mm -hmm. And Ansh also did not emerge as the number two. The number two actually was Hong. So the conservatives leapt a bit. Uh, at the end, but how do you see the split uh, between and among the conservatives, and what do you think that means going forward? I think they were really, uh, I guess, uh, debating, you know, who to support. Uh, you know, initially, as you know, uh, Ban Ki Moon uh, was kind of candidate uh, for conservative, but then he withdrew, and then uh, they were briefly supporting uh, An Chol Su. But in the end, uh, most of them came to support uh, Hong Jun-pyo. So there was a split among uh, conservative votes uh, for Hong Jun-pyo, uh, An Chol Su, and also Yu Sung Min. So I think that's why uh, they were not able to elect uh, their candidate. Mm -hmm. And Moon won in all regions other than TK and South uh, Gyeongsang-do. Uh, what does this mean in terms of the regional? overlay in Korean politics, at least specific to this election? Yeah, I think that's a very good point and very important issue because, uh, as you know, for the last uh, you know, many decades, uh, Korean voters were split uh, you know, regionally, especially uh, between uh, Jeolla province and uh, or Honam, Honam you know, area and then Gyeongsang or Yeongnam you know, area. But this time, uh, and also like in the last time, I believe that in you know, a got uh, over 80 percent uh, of the vote in uh, Daegu Gyeongsang area, and I think Moon Jae In got maybe over 90 percent uh, in the Honam area. So you know, Moon Jae In prevailed in Honam, and you know, Hong Jin Pyo, as you mentioned, uh, prevailed in Daegu Gyeongsang. But still, you know, you know, it was not as dominant as in the past. So in this regard, uh, we could say that the yeah, regionalism kind of you know, weakened uh, this time compared to uh, many times in the past. Hmm. But I see more I think, generational divide uh, among voters. So basically those from 20s to 50s, 
uh, they supported Moon Jae-in, but uh, you know, all the people, you know, 60s and over, they largely came to uh, support Hong Jun-pyo. So this time, as I said, more a uh, generational uh, divide than a uh, regional uh, in a division. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it seemed that the polling was really skewed. Uh, 60s and 70s voting a very, very different direction uh, than those in their uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, and early 50s. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts on, on what we're seeing, especially among younger Korean voters? Young people in Korea, uh, they're struggling with uh, uh, unemployment. Uh, they're struggling to, uh, you know, have a good life basically in Korea. So I don't know whether you heard about this, like three, I don't know, uh, in Korean term, they say, you know, sampo, sampo say that, uh, they are the generation that they have to give up three things, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, job and I think dating and then having babies. Mm -hmm. So. Also, you know, growing inequality uh, in Korean society and then, you know, much low social mobility. So, you know, when I was growing up uh, in Korea in 1970s, for example, there's a high social mobility. So if you're smart, if you're working very hard, you know, you can have a good job, maybe a good family and nice life. But not a lot of young people, unless you are really, you know, born into you know, top, you know, wealth family, you know, they see not much future. So there's a lot of uh, concerns and complaints and uh, maybe even resentment. And they are the one, uh, once again, uh, who demanded uh, the impeachment. They are the one uh, who wanted to have some big change uh, for Korea. And they are the one who came to support Moon Jae-in once again. Mm. And, and with 11% unemployment between the ages of 15 to 29, certainly looking for opportunities. Which brings us to the challenges part of our discussion. Uh, there seems to be a multiplicity of challenges, uh, economic, uh, as you started to speak to, and perhaps we could talk more about that from the domestic equation. Uh, Politically, in terms of where Moon Jae-in goes now with a parliament uh, with which he does not have a majority, uh, security challenges and a lot in the lead up in terms of Korean sentiments about TAD deployment and the broader question of engagement with North Korea and trying to set relations with China on a different footing. But maybe we can start then with economy and the domestic side of the house and then we'll move a little bit more toward those, those are other issues. How do you think the economy played out versus national security? Uh, I think, you know, both are, you know, big issues and you know, Korea is facing, uh, you know, really uh, tough challenges uh, in both area. But I think uh, economically, uh, as you know, Korea already entered a okay, low growth period. So, you know, Korea is having like a two, three uh, percent in the increase uh, per year. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's a growing uh, inequality among, I mean, you know, growing inequality, also unemployment among young people and, you know, household debt also, you know, increasing. Now more demand uh, for social welfare. Now, you know, Koreans also, you know, living longer. So they have to pay uh, some social welfare for elderly, but the government, uh, they are already in red in their, you know, def, you know, in, in their budget, right? Mm -hmm. So how are you going to accommodate uh, all those uh, competing demands? Uh, because uh, Moon Jae-in and other candidates, they made a lot of, uh, you know, in the pledges during campaign. Uh, how can you implement uh, all those things it's a really tough job, you know. I don't think anyone can have any magic to solve all those problems you know, quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems that one of his approaches today that struck some observers as interesting was uh, basically coming out and saying that he pled with, he begged uh, the conservatives in his initial meeting to work with him. Uh, he certainly mm -hmm. emphasized that he wanted to be a president for all, including those who 
did not vote for him. And he seems mm-hmm. to be casting, you know, a very wide appeal at this point uh, to try mm-hmm. to build some unity because he doesn't have those numbers in Parliament. How do you see that coming together? So I think uh, on the first day of his job, uh, he went to see uh, party leaders uh, from different parties. And I think personally, he's a very approachable man, you mm-hmm. know, and he's not really authoritarian uh, in personality. So I think, you know, he had a good start. And I hope that he will continue to work with uh, party leaders uh, from different groups, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, conservative and, and so on. But then, you know, once uh, you get into really uh, divisive issue, uh, it won't be easy. Mm. I mean, let alone in you know, a security issue, but also what are you going to do with uh, Jeber? Because uh, there's a demand about uh, reforming Jeber, but how are you going to do that? Right? So it's not easy to uh, create uh, in a consensus. And then, you know, even though Korean president uh, is very powerful, but uh, now the National Assembly became also stronger you know, over the years. So in order to pass any major bill uh, in the Assembly, you have to have uh, 60% of support. And Moon Jae-in's party only controls you know, 40% of the Assembly. So you really have to get extra 20% uh, from different party to you know, pass any major bill. So that's why you know, he really has to build uh, more support and more collaboration from different parties. Otherwise, not much he can do, uh, mm. even as a powerful Korean president. Mm. Well, let's talk about his comments today uh, to the press. The AFP correspondent said that she was quite impressed, one, by the warmth and openness of the approach, and two, she mm-hmm. also noted that He had his nominee for intelligence chief out answering questions very directly. So Mm -hmm. uh, that, to her, was a departure uh, from recent years. And perhaps, and it is very early in the game here, implied uh, some effort at transparency uh, Mm -hmm. and collegiality. How how do you read that type of approach and, and opening as it went today? So I thought that's a very good start once again. Uh, you know, if you look back, uh, you know, back in a, uh, you know, in a, in a governance, the one main critique was that uh, she wasn't really transparent and she wasn't really communicating uh, with people or, you know, even with you know, her key advisors. So I think transparency and communication uh, became a big issue. And I think Moon Jae-in uh, is very well aware of those issues. I mean, that's why I think he's trying to be more transparent, uh, even in appointments of key positions. And he's trying to, you know, talk to people. He's trying to communicate uh, with the Korean people. So I think in that sense, uh, you know, once again, he's quite an approachable person. Mm. Uh, I think uh, he had a good start, and I hope that he'll continue. Mm. How does one move forward on the Chable issue? Uh, frankly, I don't know whether he has any an uh, good, uh, good, you know, plan. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, there has been a close ties between government and uh, you know business, and you know, there's some corruptions. Uh, you know, as you know. The vice chairman of Samsung is in jail, right? So you know, certainly uh, he has to get deal with, uh, I don't know, you know, reforming or improving uh, things with Jaber. But uh, I haven't seen any uh, concrete plan yet uh, regarding Jaber reform. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To, to move from, from the domestic to the, the broader security agenda, uh, first up, the, the domestic part of the THAAD debate. It seemed that mm-hmm. the comments from Donald Trump about Korea absorbing the cost of THAAD deployment and then the effort by National Security Advisor McMaster to 
step back on that and to, to reinforce uh, to his Korean counterpart that the U.S. would be absorbing that cost, uh, did raise a question about uh, where we were with that among Korean voters. Uh, some suggested that it may well have pushed some votes in Moon's direction. Uh, others alluded to a sense that perhaps Korea did not want to feel uh, bullied or in a lesser position relative to Ted. Uh, do you think those are, are fair observations? Do you think that's a bit overstated? Or how do you see that developing? Because it looks like that is one issue that he will have to act on fairly quickly, and it's one that requires some skill balancing China and the United States. Mm, right. So it's a really uh, tough challenge also for uh, Moon Jae-in because you have to deal with not only uh, China and United States, also uh, domestic uh, in audience, right? Because uh, many people who supported Moon Jae-in, actually they opposed the deployment of a thought. So I think throughout the campaign, in my view, uh, Moon Jae-in kind of maintained uh, strategic ambiguity about that issue. Uh, so, you know, I don't think uh, South Korea can really return that back to the United States, right? I mean, I don't think uh, that's realistic. But I think, uh, you know, President Trump has made uh, some comments uh, they have sent some uh, confusing messages uh, to Korean people because, you know, South Korean argument uh, to China was that, you know, the thought is being, you know, deployed by the United States, right, on their own expenses. But, uh, you know, but according to, you know, so far, you know, we are supposed to provide the land. But all the expenses are being paid by the United States. I mean, that was South Korean argument uh, to China. But now Trump is saying that uh, South Korea should pay that expenses, and that really weakened uh, South Korean uh, position vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So my view is that uh, once uh, you know new government in South Korea is in, and then when Moon Jae-in uh, meets with uh, Trump, uh, I hope that they can figure out a uh, good solution. And then also uh, Moon Jae-in has to uh, talk to Xi Jinping, and and then you know hopefully uh, having China understand because you know and as you know you know China was very unhappy with uh, deployment of that, and they are doing some in my view you know economic uh, retaliation uh, against uh, South Korean product. So I think that will be uh, one of first major uh, secret issue that the new government in South Korea has to. Uh, deal with. Mm -hmm. One of his comments in his address today was that he would be willing to go to Washington, uh, willing to go to Beijing and Tokyo, and even willing to go to Pyongyang. So if we could step mm -hmm. maybe through some of those different relationships. China, as you've mentioned, has been contentious. Certainly we've seen a real economic beating up on South Korea in recent months. So clearly mm -hmm. trying to get that relationship back on an even keel would be something he would be keen on, especially given what has been so far very warm comments about his victory uh, from Xi Jinping's administration. Uh, Japan too, Abe extended his congratulations and the Japanese papers have made this their top story of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but clearly those two relationships are complex. Um, Right. How do you see steps in both directions before we get to the North Korea question? I think uh, uh, Moon Jae-in understand uh, the urgency of improving uh, relations uh, with China and, and Japan. And you know, as you know, there has been you know, vacuum in political leadership in South Korea uh, because of this impeachment process for about uh, you know, six months. So when Trump uh, took office uh, in Washington, I mean, you know, you know, Trump met with Abe, I think twice, right? Uh, one before and one after. And then he met with Xi Jinping, but then there was no Korean president, you know, for a while. So in a sense, you know, Moon Jae-in has to catch up uh, in building a relationship 
with uh, Mr. Trump. So I think that's why he feels some sort of urgency and he's willing to do you know, whatever he can do to sort of catch up you know, in building uh, a relationship with um, you know, you know, major leaders. Uh, where do you see that relationship then relative to the current state of heightened tensions trying to work with these leaders to perhaps forge a different approach uh, or at least less intentions? And then what happens about Sunshine 2 uh, or Moonshine as some papers have referred to it? Will we see, will we see uh, a, a move toward Pyongyang in different ways? Um, yeah, I don't think uh, Moon Jae-in, I mean, of course, uh, I may be wrong. I'm just like uh, speculating, you know, based on my you know, information uh, and was talking to, uh, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, their people. But I, th but I think they understand that things have changed uh, quite uh, significantly uh, over the last 10 years. Okay, so, so in my view, yeah, sure, yeah, they will certainly uh, pursue a uh, certain form of engagement uh, with North Korea. But I think they will be more cautious. Uh, they understand uh, the salience and significance of uh, nuclear and missile programs that uh, North Korea has built. And certainly, uh, you know, Moon will be, you know, working closely with the uh, United States. And I think he understands the value of the alliance. So, so even though they will pursue a certain form of engagement, you know, I don't think they'll just go back to uh, sunshine and becoming sunshine too. I think uh, he will be taking a more practical approach. And once again, they realize that uh, things have changed quite significantly over the last 10 years. Mm. Interesting. Uh, I'll end with one other question while my colleague Luce uh, collects some cards with questions for you here. But uh, how do you see him relative to the individual for whom he served as chief of staff, uh, No Moo Hyun? Mm -hmm. And how mm -hmm. do you think he steps forward in terms of the legacy of Kim Dae Jung mm -hmm. and No Moo Hyun? Uh, how do you see it relative to a departure from mm -hmm. the Lee Myung Bak and Park Geun Hye years. So I mean, regarding uh, North Korea or in general? I think both. Both are fair game relative to North Korea, relative to style and content on other fronts as well. Right. So I mean, as you said, you know, Moon Jae In was uh, chief of staff to the late President Do Moo Hyun, and they were very close to each other. So certainly, I think uh, Moon Jae In may want to. You know, take certain legacy from you know No Mu Yun or even uh, you know Kim Dae Jung, right? But uh, at the same time, uh, probably he learned some lessons. And then uh, I think you know when No Mu Yun came into office, you know I thought uh, he had uh, very good ideas, and I think he uh, pursued the right direction in many ways, especially in political reform. But he wasn't really well prepared because probably he was maybe surprised by himself that he became president, I guess. But I think you know, Moon Jae-in you know, not only learned some lessons, but also he was much more prepared in taking office because you know, he ran you know, five years ago and then lost. And over the, last, the next five years, I think you know, he really uh, you know, prepared himself to become president. I mean, that's why despite all those challenges facing Korea, and I have some expectation that uh, Moon Jae-in uh, can do a good job. I mean, so I don't know, I'd like to be more optimist. I would like to thank our visitors today, especially our members of the board and our frequent supporters here. Uh, we appreciate your having joined this taping session. Uh, it is a different type of format. We are working at distributing even more product more intensely as time goes on here in our 60th anniversary year. We do have an important program tomorrow at uh, 1230. It is the second 
of our sessions this spring on China-Korea relations. And we look forward to that. It will be a discussion led by our president, Thomas Byrne, and it will feature Isaac Stone Fish, who was a former Newsweek correspondent to Beijing and Foreign Policy Asia editor, as well as Sun Yun from uh, the Stimson Center. And we'll be talking much about China perspectives in terms of where they see North Korea and the new political situation and realities in South Korea as well. So we hope you can join us for that at 12.30 tomorrow. We'd ask that you fill out uh, our quick survey if you have any chance. And we will say goodbye to Professor Shin here uh, with a round Thank of applause. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Look forward to seeing you again out here. And uh, thank you again for your hospitality. The center was great to us when we were out last December 6th at Stanford. So thank you, Professor Shin. Mm -hmm.